screen, by the way. All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to week two orientation. You are the survivors. People have dropped like flies. The total number of people who have withdrawn from the ACE workshop is zero so far, I think. Um, uh, maybe one who never got started, but for the most part, uh, some people were definitely alarmed by the multiple environments and the complications. And uh, But we are here, uh, we are so here uh, to help you. And I think most folks, um, after a little bit of one-on-one -on -one help, realized it's not as intimidating as they thought. So please, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, yeah, and as, as Liz is pointing out, um, lots of you are involved. Oh, look, somebody's calling me on Zoom. Let me, <laughs> I mean, on uh, Teams. Hopefully she finds her way in here. Um, actually, Hannah, uh, can somebody get this link to Elaine DeMello? I just wanna make sure she knows where we are. Maybe by email would be a good way to do that. Um, okay, so I, I realized that uh, some folks are still a little bit confused by the environments. I wanted to let you know that um, towards the last part of this orientation section um, today, there's going to be a little chapter called, Help Me, I'm Overwhelmed, um, and we're going to help you get underwhelmed um, by the end of that section. Um, I put it at the end so those of you who are not overwhelmed can just take off, um, but people who need a little bit of extra help we're going to keep on going at the end, talk just a little bit more about teams and, and how to simplify your, your stuff. Um, so that will be at the end of the section today. What we're going to do first is um, recap a little bit of week one. Then Martha will take you through a tour of week two and what to expect. Um, and then again, at the end, I will have the section on um, reviewing how the workshop works for those who need a little extra help. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martha, who's going to do a little bit of a, a week one review. Hey, everybody. I am going to actually um, share my screen for this because I want to show you where this is in case you feel like following along or looking at it. Um, so let's see if I can make this work. I'm just going to share Microsoft Teams. Um, can everybody see my Teams? Great. Um, so I'm just in the general channel right here. Um, and up at the top of the channel, we've got these tabs, as you guys know, with links to the website and to Zoom. And there's a new tab here called Weekly Summaries. Um, this is something that I worked on at the end of last week. Um, which is just a week one sort of summary document. Um, I wanted to do this because there's been so much activity in Teams and it's impossible to summarize all of it, but I wanted to at least try and curate it a little bit and pull together some stuff that you might have lost, particularly in terms of resources and links, as well as identify any issues that we thought we might want to talk about um, that you know had come up particularly in cohort meetings that we were hearing about. So if I click on this document, it's just another Office 365 document. It's a Word document. You can view it. And if you want to, if you love it so much, you can download it. But there's nothing really special about it. Um, you can just review it and move on. Um, but I'm going to try and do these every week. And this week will probably be even better because I'll think about it before Friday. Um, because it didn't really occur to me to maybe try and do this until the end of last week. So um, hopefully I can mark stuff as it comes up. One of the things I did is um, I kind of just pulled some really notable comments from different participants from the four main threads. Um, ones that um, I thought were really insightful, but also that generated a lot of conversation. Don't feel bad if your comment isn't here. It's not that you weren't insightful. It's just that it didn't make sense to put everybody's comments in here. Um, so you may, if these may be things that you missed, um, so I, I pulled them out and each one has a link back to where it's located in Teams if you want to go back and read the original comment and any ensuing discussion or thread um, that emerged from that. And I'll continue to do that for the next um, two weeks uh, just to try and pull stuff up uh, that might get lost a little bit in the Teams activity. Um, but then the other thing I did, and hopefully I caught everything, is I went through and I looked for any links that people shared um, that again, especially if it was a link in a comment to an original, you know, thread that you never looked at or didn't respond to, you might have missed those resources and links. 
So I summarized all of those here in one place. You're welcome to explore them. If they look useful to you, bookmark them. You can always come back to this. If for some reason I missed something, and particularly I did not go back through it over the weekend, but feel free to just shoot me a message if there was a particular resource or link that you shared or that you saw that was useful, and I'll add it to this document. I can certainly edit it and keep it up to date. Um, but those, are, those should all be there, and it's lots of different stuff from practical things to more theoretical things around the concepts that we were talking um, to examples and other resources that people have found online. Um, and then the last, oh, well, I did put this little laws section in here because George shared this nice photo of people in Germany social distancing with pool noodles, which I've seen before, but it just never gets old, does it? So, um, you but think it would be redundant to wear that while on Zoom. Well, yeah, right, probably. I was going to suggest when you were talking about coming up with a plan for the library that we could just have a bucket of pool noodles at the front of the library and require everybody to pick one up. But no, this is next section is where we're going to um, kind of spend the most time right now, which was questions, concerns, and feedback. This is particularly anything we heard from cohort leaders or anything that we noticed in interacting with participants. Um, some of it has to do with the topics we were discussing. Some of it has to do with, as Robin said, help, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, and that, that last one we will come back to at the end of all of this today, as Robin discussed. So Robin and I are just gonna have a conversation now. Um, unmute yourself, Robin about these things. And um, right after we talk a little bit about these, Hannah's gonna lead a more open discussion with everybody. You're welcome to chime in about any of these if you have further thoughts or if there's any other questions or concerns or feedback that you have from week one, we can do that a little bit during the more open um, session that Hannah is going to lead in a few minutes. But first up, Robin. Apparently there was some discussion in cohorts about the difference between adaptability versus flexibility. Um, and I'm gonna just start this off by saying that I have to admit that I use the words <laughs> interchangeably and don't really think about the difference. Um, to me, uh, we probably could find some differences between the two, but I'm less concerned with that than what I feel like they both sort of signal, signal to on a more kind of general level. Um, what about you, Robin? Any thoughts about adaptability versus flexibility? Why, yes, Martha, I do have some thoughts. And I know this sounds really canned, but to be, not frank, heard this. to be frank, I completely forgot she was going to do this. So it is spontaneous, actually. Um, and actually, I don't think of them as the same thing. So maybe that's helpful. Um, I think about um, adaptability as a little bit more structural. So you take something that exists and you adapt it. And so one of the things I think about is like, you know, you've got a novel and you're gonna adapt it for television. Um, so you're taking something that already exists and you are shifting the structure, shifting the modality, shifting something about it that changes its shape. But I think for me, flexibility is maybe more what you were just talking about. It's that mindset. Um, and I think of something that's flexible as something like that's elastic, it moves, that's built into the shape of it. So something that you've adapted, you may adapt into something that's actually not very elastic, but it's still something you can change in different ways. So I guess for me, um, adaptability is about the structure and flexibility is about how that structure moves um, and that might be something more like a mindset that you bring to everything. Would it be, um, would it be fair but, to say adaptability yeah. is more of a practice and flexibility is more of like a philosophy then? Like adaptability is a thing you do I and flexibility think, is a way you think? I think so. I think about flexibility as something that I, is in me a little bit more and some and adaptability is something that lives in my course maybe a little bit more. Yeah, you've convinced um, me they're very different. Um, I'm glad we had this conversation. <laughs> yes, Martha, it was enriching. Thank you. Um, and if any of you have thoughts about the difference between adaptability and flexibility, um, feel free to maybe share those in the chat or um, raise your hand and say something when Hannah opens this up a little bit in a few minutes. Um, there was also some discussion, I know, in at least one cohort about this whole concept of rigor and how do we maintain academic rigor. Um, during times of great uncertainty when we're having to um, adapt. 
and be flexible in ways that maybe aren't, um, you know, what we would typically do during a regular semester. Um, I will go ahead and say that um, I have lots of thoughts about rigor and would love, in fact, Robin, I think we have a workshop coming up in the CoLab this fall. Is that right? Uh, yes, I'm going to look up the date. I think it's September 16th. But yeah. I will. We're going to be doing a workshop about this, but obviously that's after the semester starts. So just to get people thinking about this a little bit now, I added an um, kind of bonus assignment to the Thursday engagement work for this week for people who are really interested in thinking about and through rigor. Um, and I linked to a kind of older article about it, as well as a more recent Twitter thread that happened this past spring with a bunch of people talking about rigor. So if that was a concept or a topic that you really felt strongly about this week, um, as, as you were starting to think about course design, um, you might want to participate and contribute to that um, work on Thursday. Anything you want to- It was a really interesting moment where um, someone recently from business sent me an email and said, hey, I've gotten really inspired. She was inspired by Kristen Stelmox talking about um, non-disposable assignments. So she had trans, uh, trans, whatever, adapted many of her assignments into um, sort of project-based authentic assignments where students were doing more work. She had originally been very exam heavy. And so she was really excited about these new things. And her students were also really excited and she had great student evaluations, um, but she also had uh, a lot of students talking about the course being easier than it was before. Um, and she felt like that was because it changed from exams to more of these sort of um, authentic projects. And she didn't like that at all. She wanted her course to be hard and she had been known for having hard courses. So that was a really interesting um, conversation about how students understand rigor, how we think about what rigor is. I will also not name the faculty member who one time stood up on the floor of the faculty and said, we could not change from a three credit to a four credit system because four credits is more rigorous than three credits because it's one more credit. <laughs> but the question of what we mean, right? Um, we, many of us can recognize that as potentially ridiculous, but, but that doesn't mean that we actually have a very well thought out way of defining what we mean by rigor. There's also lots of people um, who write about equity who talk about the challenges um, in, in rigor and how some of those are pitched, um, not because they're hard, but because they are patently inequitable. Um, and that's uh, a, a big challenge in, in how we think about rigor. So we're hoping to mine more of that in September, um, but they're very interesting conversations. Um, I think another piece of that is, is joy. Um, if you have joy in the learning process, how will that change how one feels about learning? And how will that change how one feels about rigor? In other words, what part of rigor is correlated with misery, right? Interesting, um, interesting questions that came up that we can talk more about as we go forward. Um, the other kind of um, that I grouped with that was there were some questions about attendance. And I do wanna say, I think these were um, prompted by people who wanted to know if there was going to be any sort of new university policies about attendance. And I think I can speak for Robin and, and the collab by saying, we have no idea. We have not heard what those policies are. Um, obviously we will probably hear about them when you hear about them. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't have conversations about what attendance and presence means in a class, um, whether it's face-to-face, -face, online, some mix of those two things um, this, coming, uh, this coming semester. Um, we didn't add any special bonus activities, but feel free to weigh in on your thoughts about how you might address attendance um, going forward as you deal with you know, being adaptable and flexible in your classes. Um, it may mean rethinking how you've, how you've approached attendance in the past. And obviously, if the university comes out with policies, then we will all read those and figure out what that means as well. Um, what about cheating, Robin? Isn't it easier online to cheat? Um, I'm going to refrain from saying something about my daughter's online anatomy and physiology course that 
could get me arrested. So I will just say, um, check out the complicating the conversation section on the ACE framework. There's a whole section there. Um, I believe it says like exam heavy or proctor heavy um, uh, courses, but really what that's about is uh, the question of academic integrity and and cheating. And um, there are definitely tools that are out there like Respondus and Proctorio that um, monitor your students. Um, we encourage you to use those, but they are not ACE framework approved. <laughs> so what the ACE framework, we don't encourage you to use those. We, we, we allow you <laughs> to use those. Um, but for the ACE framework, what we really do in that section is try to rethink how we design for the web to make those kinds of technologies um, less important. Um, so we talk particularly about what's called authentic assessment um, as a way, like for example, when you get out into the work world, there's not that much concern about cheating on a project, right? <laughs> um, people don't say, did you get outside help on your project? Um, so how can you make assessments? You know, if, if one of the things we are interested in is putting students into the real world, um, tying them with their world of work, all of those things. Um, that's what that section of the ACE framework is designed to help you rethink how you're designing for more authentic um, environments. Um, and I am aware that we are wanting to move on. So I think we, I will also just remind you that the yikes, I'm overwhelmed section uh, that we heard in feedback is coming at the end of this um, uh, orientation. So stay tuned. And that wraps up week one summary. I'm going to Okay, and before we go on to the next section of the orientation, we're just going to ask um, Hannah to get some feedback from all of you guys about week one. So I'll toss it to Hannah. That's me. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to invite uh, folks to share some individual takeaways from the first week um, to respond to anything that Robin and Martha just talked about. If you had aha moments, um, concerns, that sort of thing. If you wanted to use the raise hand function so I can kind of see um, or unmute and talk either way. Yes, I'm using my raise hand. You're function. using your your raise hand function. <laughs> <laughs> it still works. Um, I just loved it's Han, it's Hannah Dutton. There you are. I see your face, Hannah Dutton. I love there and then elsewhere. Someone wrote about devising like individual sort of explorations or or sort of observation trips. And Hannah, you were talking about um, garbology and the use of artifacts and both of those ideas for me, like that, it, that as, as examples of things in online or high flex that students who were away could do individually that would also be a part of a togetherness um, really struck me. And I think Hannah, yours was in the context of archeology span and the other, I'm sorry, I can't remember, there's so many threads. Um, was I think in the context maybe of natural sciences and like getting out and observing and describing, but both of those are so, and I think Hannah Hounsel, you might remember, I don't think anyone else here's, did, H Hannah Dutton, were you in creative writing too? Yeah, so like, like writing about uh, like this description, observation, getting out into the world, like looking at, a, at an object and like imagining and describing, that's very much in line with a lot of what I like to do in creative writing. And so I was really excited both to see something familiar in that, but then also to see a, a way of um, having students, no matter where they were, um, getting, uh, being able to do some of that work in a new way. Um, and I really enjoyed both of those threads. They were very helpful. Thanks, awesome. Um, Allie, I see your uh, hand is up. Do you wanna go next? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, I took away from this is something that I think kind of been a, a theme that's gone um, throughout, and just the, the level of being overwhelmed. I think what happened um, was there were so many new things to try and experience, and all of those kinds of things that I almost had to put my patients to look at it, understand some of this stuff, and then kind of put it away, and then look at the other stuff more deeply because I was literally looking at all of these things and in my head trying to 
maybe not implement them on paper, but implement in my head. Well, what would it look like in this class? What would it look like? And it just became too much. And I had to kind of give myself permission to say, you know what? I can only do so much. And my problem mm -hmm. is as soon as I get overwhelmed, I shut down. Mm -hmm. So I totally shut down and didn't do anything for like two days. And then the guilt kicked in. And you know, all of that, like that whole portal vicious cycle. So um, I don't know, I feel like just, like, um, just being a little transparent with that might actually help some other people too who might have been having the same kind of feelings. Um, I didn't actually contact any of the team and say, oh my God, I'm quitting, but it did occur to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know, I just thought that. Yeah, and I really appreciate people being honest about that. And um, I think just to respond to that a little bit, last week we definitely were thinking about what a lesson in empathy for your students too because um i think they might feel similar similarly in the fall i knew they felt that way in the spring with everything suddenly being online and using all these new technologies and some classes worked differently than other classes some classes met on zoom some classes everything was on moodle some classes used email students were trying to catch up so um to kind of feel a little bit of that overwhelming feeling that maybe some students felt it's not a new feeling they will feel that every semester um it's just such a great lesson in empathy to be able to be like oh i remember feeling like this i almost wanted to quit don't drop the class we can work through this that sort of thing so i think that's really just such a good lesson to bring with you does anybody else want to share? I haven't seen any hands. Feel free to come to the mic. Um, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, um, I'm just really experiencing um, the difference between online delivery and face-to-face -face delivery in terms of trying to figure out balance because <laughs> this summer, I in the fall i was supposed to have a face-to-face -face class um and it was coming up like right when they shut down and the students just it was a graduate class and there were i think there were only eight students in it and they were all being overwhelmed because they were all teachers so they said we really want to take this in the summer so mm -hmm. i didn't teach it in the spring and then just you know did the thing where you teach it for free in the summer to make up that you didn't do it in the spring. So I'm teaching that and I had already slated to teach two other online classes this summer. So I have 40 online students right now, mm. graduate level, and um, I love it, but I am so, it makes me realize how much I talk because mm. When I have a face to face, you know, I'm giving them feedback and I'm talking and we're interacting and I'm trying to replicate that in an online environment. And it is um, about 12 hours a day. And I'm not kidding to do it to the level that I want to do it to. Mm. And I just, I'm trying to figure out, you know, like in the fall uh, and who knows what's going to happen, but I have 45, uh, many of you have many more than this, so I'm not complaining, but I have 45 undergrads and they typically need even more feedback. So um, I'm just trying to figure out how to, and I'm not complaining about workload, but I just want to do a good job and mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to maintain the same feeling like I'm giving the same, you know, I, I mean, I feel good. The grad students seem happy, but I just, I, I don't know. I, it's so it's so different. It's not better or worse. It's just really different and just really wanting to learn some other other tools um, to give feedback in ways that maybe I don't know might work just as well as if I'm face to face with them. So yeah, but I love I love the course. I got myself into two quality matters classes at the same time. Too. <laughs> So I, and I'm trying to do this turbo tiger thing. I am a little maxed, I'll be honest, but I love what I'm doing, all of it, but I'm a little maxed, but that's okay. It's good. You know, I'm not bored. I noticed that Robin just unmuted. Robin, would you like to chime in? <laughs> the one thing I was just going to say is, um, 
you know, I think the ACE course can be, you know, this workshop is helpful to prod you to think in new ways and, and do certain things. But it, as you've noticed, we can't possibly be very instrumental because the kinds of things you need are very diverse and we can't build all those things into the course. One thing I think this workshop will do is it'll help you realize, oh, I wish I was better at this or I could do this one thing. I just wanna remind you that the thing you do when that happens is you make an appointment um, with me or Martha or Hannah. If you don't know the right person, our webpage says, I don't know the right person, please you know, fill that form out and then we will sort you. Because sometimes it may also be um, Jason Ninos from Academic Technology or a couple of other different people. Um, but when you find that there's a specific thing you wanna do, like I'd like to do group work I literally don't know how to make group work work or um, I need a tool that does blank you know that's the kind of thing to get extra help with that um, may not necessarily be in the course so please don't hesitate um, to make those appointments with us um, right from the collab front page website Great. Um, perhaps I just want to be cognizant yep. of time so I think we can um, move along but uh, yep. there's also some wonderful stuff in the chat um, Robin, your point about uh, if we can kind of change the narrative so that overwhelmed means become engaged instead of withdraw or give up. Um, and I think one of the big things that I'm learning as a facilitator of this is modeling that sort of um, conversation for folks. Um, and I just wanted to point that out before we moved on. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. I'm going to stop recording. No, Martha's going to stop recording. <laughs> um, and we